We should start. So welcome back to our uh, evening and final session of uh, this event. So let me introduce our next uh, keynote speaker, Professor Taliaferro. Professor Taliaferro is a professor of philosophy at St. Olaf College. He's a senior research fellow at the Institute for Faithful Research. Uh, is the editor of one of the, of the journal Open Theology, and his most recent book is uh, The Image in Mind, The Image in Mind, Theism, Naturalism, and Imagination. Please welcome Professor Charles Taliaferro. Today is going to talk about the problems of philosophy in the living God, personalism in the philosophy of religion. So thanks a lot, Professor Taliaferro. Uh, okay. As we, his camera is not working, so I will share is picture instead. <laughs> yeah, I thought you might as well get an image of me. Um, just the sheer vacuity or blackness of it all. It'd be very apophatic, you know. So anyway, that's more or less what I look like. But um, anyway, I want to thank Nicola, all every participant um, in this conference. This has been very fruitful. Um, what I thought I would do is um, reflect with you, especially given that this is at the end of the conference, there's one more presentation, and I would um, just go on for about a little over 20 minutes on the framework for doing philosophy of religion. What framework have we been presupposing here? Um, what problems are we working on in philosophy? And how should we proceed in the future? So as I go over the different presentations that we've um, gone to, uh, and I have deeply appreciated these, we began with Nietzsche. We then moved to philosophy of language, proper names. There have been two papers on Hume, theological fatalism, thinking about freedom in light of divine attributes. We looked at the Kabbalah, with two papers on divine hiddenness. We have had um, two papers on the reasonability of religious experience in terms of reformed epistemology, and then this X case um, response. Two papers on love, Wittgenstein, Aquinas, and the apophatic. We have had papers on divine attributes and uh, Altruism, I have a comment on that really quickly. In the last paper on uh, Cartesian reflections. I, I just have to sneak in a comment on the altruism paper because my sound wasn't working then. My, my suggestion was going to be uh, to this very fine paper. I thought maybe to use the term the apocalyptic um, catastrophe rather than religious catastrophe. Second, you might want to look at uh, the manuals on dying in the early enlightenment when people were really concerned there was a chance there's a God and a chance you're going to be damned and what you can say on your deathbed that would get you into heaven. These are very interesting. Um, finally, uh, the, the notion of going around the world and supporting people to believe in God may not really fit with the passage that you cited, which was Christ is calling us to go to people in prison, to feed the hungry, and so on. And so the idea of getting to heaven just by believing in God is um, a little problematic, if, given the verse that you were appealing to. It's kind of like to go back to the paper on Wittgenstein. It's not so much look at what people do, not just what they say. And so somebody could be a Christian theist, but a practical atheist. So as I look at the, uh, the rich display of topics, and I haven't covered all of them, um, I ask myself, what, what I ask us, what framework is it, are we assuming or uh, should we assume going forward? Well, I'm gonna, I hereby propose that the best framework is called personalism. Now, personalism is a movement in philosophy. It's not as well known as utilitarianism, Marxism, etc. But it's um, the term was first used in the 19th century by actually Whitman. It emerged in France and, and Britain. Uh, and 
personalism has been traced to Latin America, especially, um, I'm sure Brazil, but certainly uh, Uruguay, Puerto Rico, uh, and elsewhere. And according to personalism, one of our foundational reference points should be the reality and value of persons, our thinking and reflection together as substantial individuals who endure over time, who have an agency, who can make a difference in the world around us for good or for ill. And it might seem that this is simply a kind of common sense um, framework, and in a way it is. This is the common sense school of thought of Thomas Reed, that you and I are persons and that we apprehend ourselves as agents and substantial individuals who endure over time. And we live in a world of values. Um, the form of personalism that I'm going to highlight, and especially that I would commend to you, is called Boston personalism because it flourished at Boston University. Um, some of the main figures were Baum, um, Brightman, and Bertacci. But probably the most famous self-identified personalist that you will know is Martin Luther King Jr., who went and studied theology at Boston University under Brightman and did his work on personalism. Um, personalists take um, as as given, but we can we can call this prima facie given, that persons count, and they were very active in uh, supporting migration in Boston, vast migration from the late 1800s, dock workers and so on, the marginalized, the under, the non-privileged, and they um, they sought to oppose a kind of mechanistic and also utilitarian approach to persons. Because the Boston personalists are not the probably the most known to you, I'll simply mention just a few Europeans. Um, Max Shaler was a very famous um, representative of this school of thought. And as was John Paul II, who did uh, his philosophical work on Shaler, Gabriel Marcel, Martin Buber, Rosenzweig, Levinas. Now, most of the um, personalists, especially the Boston personalists, were theists. But those who are identified as personalists were not always theists. In Uruguay, the, the personalist um, most well known there was a um, agnostic, and probably the most famous personalist uh, McTaggart, who believed that reality at base is a community of souls. And that has to be as personalist as they come. But M McTaggart, of course, was an atheist. So while the Boston personalists and the majority of them were uh, theists, uh, not all of them were. And so accepting a personalist point of view is not to beg the question against atheism and so on. Though I would submit um, personalists in general, even the atheists and, and agnostics, at least took um, theism and alternative views of the sacred seriously and not to be dismissed. Why? Because they took persons seriously. And I think that as philosophers of religion, uh, and this is true for people in ethics and political philosophy, but as philosophers of religion, we're philosophically reflecting on actual bodies, communities, and traditions of people. So we're not just doing abstract thought experiments of the Chinese rum or zombies in philosophy of mind. We're actually reflecting on um, those beliefs that are hard, part and parcel of the vast majority of the world population. So the Pew Foundation estimates that 84% of the world is religiously self-identified. That means over eight out of the 10 people that you meet have some kind of religious affiliation. The statistics here are quite extraordinary. And it means that philosophy of religion um, has a readership, has an audience. And the personalists um, 
certainly the Boston Personals, engaged in trying to communicate um, broadly popular philosophy. And I would say personalism obviously did not just begin when the word began, but the Cambridge Platonists, the people I think that got it most right in the history of philosophy in the 1600s who were personalists, they also engaged in popular philosophy. So Cudworth, for example, when he addressed the House of Parliament, he actually, his text was basically the Euthyphro Dilemma. And his view as a Platonist was God loves things because they're good. They don't become good because they are God. They're, they're loved by God. So this movement of personalism is anchored in social and political change. It's anchored in what I think faces us as a generation of philosophers of religion. Um, they were deeply engaged in combating racism. So as I look at the history of philosophy, and I think of that phrase, the problems of philosophy, which was the title of Bertrand Russell's famous book from 1912, I asked myself, well, were there always the same problems in philosophy or did they shift? And there has been a shift from time to time. So to reference, oh, Aquinas of the medieval period was just one paper on Aquinas. But for Aquinas and his mates, the problem of philosophy was coming to terms with Christian theism and the works of Aristotle or and or Arabic philosophy, or I should say Islamic philosophy, not just Arabic, it could include Farsi. Um, and so similarly, you know, the problem one of the problems in philosophy in uh, the European Enlightenment was uh, Chinese philosophy. How do we explain what happened when we discovered this vast tradition of Confucianism and Taoism um, and Moism? What do we think about that? And Leibniz uh, actually came up with the brilliant idea that they were all Leibnizians. They just didn't realize it. He basically argued that the Chinese had the same view that he had. Um, the problem of philosophy also shifted towards the new world. And the, uh, those Iberian philosophers, like Francisco de Vitoria, who opposed Spanish and Portuguese expansion into South America based on natural law. So the problems of philosophy shift from time to time. For now, uh, in, as of 2021, it seems to me one of our concerns should be religious implication um, in t terms of um, racism, how to understand race theory or what is what is race, and to understand both in our own history, the history of philosophy of religion, what has been racist in the past. Like Hume, as I mentioned in that conversation, was a um, oh, essentially a white supremacist. He was actually cited by slave owners and people in the slave trade as justifying slavery. It wasn't just armchair philosophy. Kant also um, was not in explicitly endorsing slavery, but he, he did endorse a very low view of black and brown people versus whites and so on. So we need to come to terms with race. And it also seems to me that as philosophers of religion, we should follow the Boston personalists in being concerned with social issues, such as um, toleration. This was very big among the 17th century Cambridge Platonists, John Locke, of course, treatise on toleration and the like. I think this should exercise us now. And for those of us who work where there are large populations of Islamic immigrants, um, a very important concern is the extent to which we can, in our classes and seminars, offer a philosophical critique of, say, um, Averroes, Avancena, Al-Ghazali, and so on, without our students being, being feeling that they are being attacked, or if one draws into questions the eternality of the Quran. How, how is that possible to do under a condition where 
some of your students who are learning your uh, languages, whether it's Portuguese, Spanish, uh, Danish, and so on, Swedish, in these universities where there are large immigrant populations or indigenous populations, how can one engage in tolerable, respectful dialogue? This seems to me very important. And the Boston personalists, because they took persons highly seriously in our, our thinking with each other matters, uh, and on this point, they were very suspicious of forms of naturalistic uh, scientism, which seemed to undermine um, reason itself by their lights. One should support um, philosophy in public, that is reasoning together with a free press. And my organization, the American Philosophical Association, as I'm a North American, um, is very much behind a free press and also the seeking to um, liberate or challenge the imprisoning of persons because of their being in opposition to the dominant regimes. Um, this is why, by the way, I myself uh, have started doing some teaching in American prisons and I'm planning on doing it um, even more starting next summer. This I, I'm inspired by, in doing so, by Martin Luther King Jr. and by the, by the notion that philosophers, the lovers of wisdom, are called to try to contest and challenge um, what we perceive to be the in, 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 inequities of our time, to seek to hold up the dignity of human um, reasoning with each other uh, without having an extremely narrow conception of what that reasoning and methodology amounts to. I think I'm now going to transition to the following. Um, what uh, I'm commending then personalism as a prima facie framework for the carrying out of philosophy. And I believe actually we've been doing something like that. We haven't been questioning the, the actual reality of persons. We've been proceeding um, with um, an assumption that values matter basically at some form of moral reasoning. There's also been uh, some adherence to the notion of um, actually normativity in terms of evidence. That is our Oxford friend, Stephen, I think he was arguing that it's irresponsible, you know, epistemically to have certain beliefs or not. I challenge him on this and, and the like, but it, it still has to do with an appeal to what's what we um, what we are appealing to each other about what we should think in an open society where there is very minimal appeal to force. There is um, rather the kind of formation of a philosophical culture. By philosophical culture, I mean a culture in which people are invited, are valued to be invited, to offer reasons for and against issues of governance, distribution of wealth, the economy, and so on. So my um, view here, I commend to you, is that something like personalism is a very natural foundation for a democratic republic. By a democratic republic, I mean a procedural one in which persons can hold each other as accountable for their reasons and seek to persuade, persuade each other about how, how we should live. Well, in the next 10 minutes, and then I'll we have 30 minutes of um, objections or comments, or we can just move to the next speaker. Um, what about uh, three other starting points of philosophy? Well, our conference began with a brilliant paper on Nietzsche and a discussion of two forms of nihilism, active and passive, and Nietzsche's critique of monotheistic religions. Should we begin with Nietzsche? And I will address that. And then I would like to ask, should we begin with Hume? 
And then should we begin with scientific naturalism? What about these alternatives? Why personalism versus, say, Nietzsche? Given the shortness of time, it's hard not to seem kind of more, um, oh, I don't know, um, like I'm simply declaring things rather than working through them. But I would say we do, we philosophers, we we should listen to Nietzsche. Nietzsche deserves a place at the table. And his um, mode or method of suspicion is commendable. Merrill Westfall um, actually praises Nietzsche and others like Marx and Freud who question religious life. And and the, these, this should be taken very seriously. Um, however, let's also listen to um, the replies to Nietzsche. For example, Max Scheler, whom I identified as a personalist. Um, his book, Resentiment, is a um, brilliant challenge to Nietzsche's own view that Christian values emerge from resentment. And we also need to step back and think, is Nietzsche's methodology something we should assume at the beginning? I, I would warrant that there are all kinds of problems here. For example, Nietzsche's view of truth is highly problematic. Um, he holds, if there is no God, there's no objective truth. But he's an atheist. Uh, if he doesn't believe there's a God, then how can he believe that atheism is true? It seems to me that atheism is the view that it's false that there is a God. Nietzsche, uh, famously, is a perspectivalist. That is, he believes truth is a matter of perspective. This is um, an illuminating, challenging position. Kierkegaard has something like this in terms of um, truth as subjectivity. However, I submit to you that this should not be our starting point. Realism is extremely hard to avoid. Perspectivalists, it seems to me on pain of absurdity, have to, expect, have to accept the idea that there really are certain things, namely perspectives. Um, conceptual anti-realists, like Hilary Putnam, of course, though, he changed his mind. I was one of his students like five or six times in the course of his life. A great professor, wonderful, wonderful. But even when he said there are only conceptual schemes, he had to, he had to assume there are, is such a thing as a conceptual scheme. So we might wind up with Nietzsche, but oh, even this point about nihilism, Nietzsche was, by the way, not at all a nihilist in my view, um, but nihilism is the most counterintuitive position on this planet, maybe next to the idea that there's no such thing as consciousness. In our um, experience of ourselves, we couldn't share a cup of coffee or have a conference um, without assuming a vast array of common values that really are binding and are not just a matter of um, forms of life that we have elected conventionally. That is, it strikes me that getting cancer didn't become bad because we live in a, a conventional community that abhors cancer. Um, no, these things are actually observable um, as, as ill. So I think Nietzsche, we might wind up with him, but I don't think that's a good starting point. What about Hume? Some think we, that's where we should be. There's a famous line that um, the human condition is the Humean condition. Maybe that's true, but let's look at what Hume asked us to accept at the beginning, uh, I, what he called ideas or sensations, a reflection on ideas and the relation between ideas. And where does that lead him? It leads him to deny the existence of substance, the, at least on the conventional reading. And Hume studies a great um, journal, but there's huge disagreements about him on almost every point here. But in a textbook definition, he denies the existence of the substantial self. 
He denies that we have any conceptual grasp on causation. Um, he leaves modality out of the picture. And then he also, in terms of values, I love the paper on Hume, by the way, um, on both on miracles as well as the one on his dialogues. But he leaves you with the problem of philosophy of how do you derive an ought from an is? How do you do it? And so we, we get a cluster of these problems generated by the human framework. Okay, now, but let's drop back and ask ourselves, is the human framework reasonable? I would say absolutely not. His thesis that the self is not observable, I think is demonstrably, but as a conceptually absurd. You can't experience things he ident identified as ideas, like we'll just go with the obvious pain, without observing that you yourself are in pain. You don't go, there's pain, I wonder if I'm having it. it you feel yourself in pain. If you see green, yellow, you are seeing your, you are observing yourself seeing these colors. Moreover, you can't even think without knowing that you yourself are an enduring substantial being. I submit you could not, this is not original to me, you couldn't understand this sentence without understanding that you are enduring over time. You do not live in an instant. Nobody can. Nobody can think in an instant. The present is, uh, to use the William James term, thick. Instants are like points. They take up no space at all. And for C.A. Campbell said, to hear Big Ben told 10 times, you have to be the self-same person who heard it bell, it rang once and rang twice and so on. So uh, I'm going to, at the risk of trying to be funny, and, and this will probably totally fail, but um, what I do with my students, I say, you can't even say the word avocado in an instant. And I've developed this over time. I can say the word avocado very fast. Avocado, avocado. But as I um, point out to the students, this is, this is not instantaneous. Um, avocado, if you slow the tape down. Thought, if, if, you, if you are thinking, this is a Cartesian move, if you are thinking, you have demonstrated the existence of temporality because you can't think except over time. Now, maybe there's an exception for God, and there are probably some very traditional uh, theists here, and so may maybe there's a, an analogous definition of thinking. But for you and me, we have to accept endurance. And it strikes me, especially, give me another six minutes, please. Um, I think we have to take seriously the observability of matters that are evil and repugnant. Now, maybe we'll come to the position of believing in error theory. Maybe we'll be convinced by J.L. Mackey that all this is um, queer, to use his very odd term. Uh, but if so, this oddity is strewn throughout all our lives. The perception, I, I know I'm repeating myself here a little bit, the observability of harm if somebody's raped and you ask the person, well, who's to say that rape is wrong? I think the person would quite correctly say, well, I say it's wrong. I feel this as a violation, as a direct harm. So I think this notion of is to an odd, even G.E. Moore, who coined the phrase, the open question, even he says in matters of health, things become more less clear because then it seems like it seemed to Moore himself that we have something that's actually observable. That is where you can see the good of a person who is healthy. And you can also see the tragedy of somebody um, who's being dismembered. As a side, I'd say the most effective representation of a case against Hume can be George Orwell's essay on a hanging. He describes with very tender sensitivity the, I'll say, even beauty of a living, breathing human being, but who's being led to a scaffold where he will die. And you can almost observe the, um, the great harm that's being done. 
Now, you may have a theory of justice according to which this person committed a crime and deserves the hanging, but you can observe the harm in a way that upsets the human position. So we may, again, wind up with Hume, we may wind up with Nietzsche, but I suggest at the beginning, we should begin with a more the personalist affirmation. What about scientific naturalism? There are uh, philosophers for whom naturalism is the only game in town. Um, that was especially big, I think, in the 70s and 80s, maybe even early 90s. But now there is a real battle between what might be called scientific naturalism and liberal naturalism. Strict naturalism, which would be, um, oh, Daniel Dennett, Paul and Patricia Churchland, Stephen Stitch, and the like, these people deny the existence of qualia. They deny the existence of a substantial self over time. This is too much um, for liberal naturalists. And so naturalism seems to have um, be turning towards a broader position. A question here I would raise is how broad can naturalism be when it also invites a question of whether we should still be naturalists? And I think that is, um, is important. And similar along these lines, uh, in, in the general philosophical landscape in which we find ourselves, I think that we should be wary of hegemony. So just three more minutes here. That is the declaration that one school of thought, I'd say if I was a naturalist, I'd be a liberal naturalist. As it happens, I'm a Christian theist. Fallback positions would be Jewish, Muslim, and Hindu, or Hindu. <laughs> um, but the, the idea is um, no one view um, in terms of the main positions, whether it's in ethics, in philosophy of mind, and so on, has um, a right, I think, at this point, because we've seen so much changes, has a right to be considered um, the only option. When I was um, in grad school, when I was studying in Oxford, the private language of Wittgenstein was considered uh, unanswerable. It was just considered completely um, unquestionable. F five years later, with the work of John Foster, Richard Swinburne, others, Galen Strawson, suddenly it's an open question. When I was at uh, Harvard studying philosophy, nominalism, was you know with Quine he he adopted classes eventually but it was nominalism all the way down. Um, has that been successful? No. There's been a revival of Platonism all across the board. So I would suggest to you that a, a better starting point would be this personalist, more or less, um, I'd say common school of the of philosophy from Thomas Reed, but which takes um, what appears to be the case to actually be the case until subject to further scrutiny. Maybe to use some different terms, um, our common sense belief that we're persons, that we exist over time, that we have values, I think should be regarded as innocent until proven guilty. That's not original with me. Um, and in light of uh, two minutes, uh, in light of this more personalist, capacious way of doing philosophy of religion, I think we should invite pluralism because we're not just persons. We're Buddhists or Christians or agnostics or, well, Buddhists or atheists. Most of them are not theists. But, you know, persons do have, we, we do, many of us, eight out of 10 of us on this planet have religious identity. And I think this should invite us in our philosophy and religion departments to invite a certain kind of pluralism. I think um, personalism is compatible with having a colleague who is Hindu and says, well, look, let's do philosophy. I'm gonna assume the Vedas are authoritative and see how far I can go. That seems to me a worthy undertaking. Let's do it with uh, Shankara, his interpretation or the Bhagavad Gita with theism. I think all those are legitimate, but it's, I, but I commend an overall personalist framework on the grounds that it's the it's the foundation of a democratic 
republic. It's the foundation for doing public philosophy of trying to convince ourselves of certain goods and ills. And I think it's um, it bears fruit. Thank you so much for listening. I invite any uh, questions or comments. I suppose you can remove my, pe my picture. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thanks a lot, Charles. Been a very interesting and thought provoking talk. So, uh, any questions? Questions? We can start with questions. We have enough time for questions, I guess. Okay, well, our uh, audience works on its uh, shyness. I have a couple of questions. Now, I would like, uh, first of all, like to ask you, I mean, I understand how personalism can help us in order to address some problems in philosophy of mind, for instance, or in uh, political philosophy. But I was wondering whether you could tell us more on, say, how can personalism or personal, a personalist perspective address some problems uh, in uh, philosophy of religion, some classic or contemporary problems in philosophy of religion? And what are the problems in, uh, say, in philosophy of religion that you think uh, will benefit or uh, like personalism will cast a new light on uh, which problems in philosophy of religion? OK, Was thank you. No, no, good, good, good. Yeah, no, that's good. I um, um, and I do invite really just uh, any comments, uh, just uh, even you're wrong, that's fine. <laughs> um, to go with Nicola's point, I would say that, uh, well, I'll speak to three areas. One is, as I've suggested, I think a personalist perspective would incline those of us in philosophy of religion to be more concerned than normal with matters of religious tolerance of tolerance of migration. This would include taking up concerns with um, that I I have struggled with with my Muslim students. My uh, students who are from um, Pakistan, uh, India, Iran, and also Egypt, um, they are facing an issue with their families and their communities. If they were to, to convert from Islam, they would be considered apostate. This would be very grave. And what I seek to do is to, I don't encourage conversion. I'm not an apologist in the classroom by any means. But um, my students know that I am a, a Christian theist. You have only to look at Wikipedia and just this, or look at what I've published. And so you can disguise your, your religious convictions in many cases, but if you've published anything, um, your students will know what you believe. And what I've sought to do in, as a philosopher of religion is to try to make um, reflection on religion as safe as possible. So I, in, I defined actually the word apostasy in a religious dictionary that was non-specific to Islam and so on. But I tried to, to define apostasy in a way that didn't identify your college son or daughter um, questioning their faith and, and so on. So the more you can do, and I think personalism would encourage this, to make ph creative philosophy of religion safe, the better. The, the second point, I'm, I guess I'll make two more. Uh, one is that in terms of the divine attributes that we've discussed over these three days, uh, namely love, knowledge, and passability, each of those very strongly intersects with personalist concerns. Personalists, first and foremost, believe in human agency as being um, accountable and worthy of reverence and respect. So a personalist, if if they are faced with, say, a strong or, or moderate understanding of, of omniscience, they're going, if the strong view of omniscience is going to eclipse or overshadow um, 
a human agentive power, they're going to tend to, to moderate the understanding of, of omniscience. And it's not, it's not because of gerrymandering. I think that their concept of God, which is forged in natural theology as well as religious experience, is that God is the God of justice. So God, by their lights, and back to the paper that was um, done really brilliantly uh, yesterday on um, God being uh, approached through marginalized people. Miranda Frick was mentioned, and those people that have suffered epistemic injustice. And our speaker there was concerned that, you know, the God of these religions surely uh, would be a God of liberation who would speak to or can speak to these situations, these, these peoples. And on the business of passability and impassibility, the personalist tradition is going to move in the direction of passibilism, that is suffering love is a way of identifying with other people. You asked about a philosophy of love, Nicola, and for them, it'd be traditional beneficent love and unitive love. The two greatest loves are one, you love the good of the other, and you, other things being equal, you desire the unity with the beloved. Um, and so you're going to incline towards passibilism, but you may, because of the points that were brought up in that paper, are you going to believe in God who suffers forever? Um, this is almost a God, according to Richard Creel, that you should take pity on. This might give an indication that probably passibilists like Martin Luther King Jr. believe that at the very end of the day, God loves and desires all of us to come together as a community and with mutual respect and consideration. And so that might be true, not just in this life, but in the next. So I think passibilism would have those contours. Thanks a lot. So, other question? If not, I can make a quick because, you know, it's... Uh... Ah, we have another question, so by Professor Greco. Hi, uh, John. Yes, thanks, Charles. Uh, so, so, I've run into personalists before because I was at Fordham University and there were some people there, actually Joe Kotersky, who recently passed away, considered himself a personalist. And um, so I suppose I'd like you to help me out understanding what it takes to be a personalist and what would disqualify you as being a personalist. Because listening to, listening to you talk and listening to Joe talk, you know, I find it hard pressed to find somebody who wouldn't buy into it. I mean, there are people who are certainly there are people who, because of some kind of philosophical position, might deny that persons are valuable or that there's value or that there's any kind of robust agency. Sure, we can get ourselves into those kinds of views. Well, when you just, you know, just thinking about, you know, ordinary working philosophers who are in the grips of those, you know, the radical views, I don't see a lot of people who wouldn't count as personalists, given what I've heard. I think you just need to be a decent person to be a personalist. Not, not to say <laughs> that these other philosophers aren't decent people, because that's not what I was implying. What I meant was that they're probably decent people, and their decency betrays the radicalness and implausibility of their philosophical stances. So yeah, I, I think you get the question, right? Um, do we have something here that actually has opponents that, uh, and, and you know, it does have opponents. I've, I've just said it myself, there are opponents. But do we have something here 
you know, usually a philosophical position has lots of opponents. You know? <laughs> and and uh, you, you, you don't think the majority holds a philosophical position. That's an odd philosophical position if it's something that like the vast majority holds. So am I misunderstanding what it takes to be a personalist? Okay, I'm going to respond. Thanks, John. And I'm, I'm very sorry. I had a, a medical issue that I wasn't able to l hear your presentation. But um, I've interacted with you before with great profits, and so and it's great to see you. Um, I would say that I, I love what you um, propose here. That is... And, and in a way, I'm going to buy it. That is, personalism is could well be understood as treating each other with the apparent dignity and respect that we appear, at least you and me and all the others at this conference and in the philosophical community in general, um, to treat each other. But um, it has to be said that for some, this is a provisional uh, judgment or a, um, a cordial one or practical one, as opposed to one that is, has a, um, is deep. That is, uh, so for the personalists, they um, resist any worldview that would um, denigrate the notion of the individual person's importance and value. What are those worldviews? Well, one that they struggled with was Marxism. And a Marxist, he, she, they, may well, in the marketplace of, of ideas, treat each other with great respect, cordiality, and, and so on, and assume that you're a person, he's, they are people. But ultimately, Marxism uh, Marx himself described an individual as a an ensemble of uh, social relations. So you can see in the early Marx, he is a personalist. He is as concerned about the individual uh, worker and chimney sweep, child laborer, as Charles Dickens. But in the later Marx, the individual gets absorbed, at least as I read Marx, into the proletariat or the bourgeoisie. The individual gets lost or subsumed. And I think this is, this is true with um, serious, no, I won't say serious, but scientific naturalists of the kind like Daniel Dennett, the Churchland, Stephen Sitch, and others. Um, they will say, yes, I believe that grapefruit tastes a certain way. But at the end of the day, and you exist and I exist, but Dennett, if you just do a Google for Dennett, uh, the self and narrative center of gravity, and he is committed to believing that on some level, you and I are narrative fictions. And uh, utilitarians or David Hume and Parfit and, and the like, they all wind up subverting what appears to be, to, what appears to the personalist to be uh, a stable, enduring fact of our reality and the goodness of our embodied life. That is, our our life as embodied beings is not, um, it's not, we're not engaged in error theory when we believe that skin laceration is bad for us. So I would say, you know, um, the utilitarian, and there have been great utilitarians, I was so happy to hear that paper, and so glad for it to be acknowledged that Actually, the early utilitarians were were Christian theists. Some of them were Anglican pastors. So we think of Jeremy Bentham as the great early modern utilitarian, who, of course, was an atheist. And he was the only one who said, um, well, not the only one, but he, he famously said, I didn't lose my religion. He said he didn't lose it because he never had it. Um, but, okay, Bentham, Bentham has an atheistic... Um, utilitarianism, Mill has a kind of agnostic utilitarianism, but what's common to a lot of utilitarianism is the subversion of the individual to what becomes an abstractum, whether you're a rule or act utilitarian, namely you want to maximize happiness. And for um, personalists, it would be the 
the happiness of individuals who have whose happiness has value because the individual has value. So persons are not valuable because they're kind of like a this is not original to me, like they're a bucket in which you can get some happiness injected into it. Rather, happiness is considered um, a feature of what at best is an individual's flourishing, hopefully in coordination and community with other individuals. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's a good answer. I mean, just to give it back to you, I think what you're saying is that you you have to be committed to a certain ontological thesis that, that persons are fundamental ontologically, and then also uh, uh, an ethical thesis that persons are have a, a fundamental value as well, a fundamental um, uh, ontological status. Um, so that still includes a lot of people, but it does narrow it down uh, in terms of philosophical theses. Um, was my giving it back to you correct? Is that, uh, um, Yes, I think, uh, Tom, as always, I, I admire you and your work and your points are really well taken. So, um, yeah, if, if we're to sum up my response, that is, personalists are committed, those who are self-described personalists are committed to what we could call uh, a deep ontology and a deep axiology. So let it be granted that almost everybody who's decent <laughs> acknowledges that persons exist and have objective qualities and should be listened to and heard and we should engage in um, reasoning with each other without resorting to violence or intolerance, except in extreme cases. Let's say that's true, but the question is, is it true provisionally and just prima facie or is it secundum facie as second glance? Is, does this turn out to be chimerical? And some people like Parfit, people from Buddhist tradition would say that the personalist is hanging on, clinging on too much to a particularized understanding of substantial change over time of the, of the substantial person. The Buddhists will, of course, have to say, you know, the Dalai Lama was born in the 1940s and, you know, when he died and he has a history, great biography was just written on him. But at the end of the um, authoritative bi bi uh, biography of him, the last line is that, um, according to the Dalai Lama, he himself does not exist. Mm -hmm. And so a personalist would go, great, love the Dalai Lama on compassion, love a lot of this stuff, but I still believe mm -hmm. that you, the Dalai Lama, are a person subsistent over time who actually does exist. And actually, in this biography, um, it comes out that the Dalai Lama doesn't even believe Tibet exists, like at the fundamental deepest level. Yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you. Great, thanks. Okay, there is another question on the chat. Uh, Charles, can you read it? I can't. Can you read it for me, please? Okay. Thank you for your talk, Professor Taliaferro. It's a very interesting proposal. What positions in the discussion of philosophy of religion about the nature of God do you think will be challenged by adhering to personalism? Maybe an impossible God or a God with predestine or predestination, some people to salvation. I think you already answered uh, about this in your response to Professor Nicola, but I would like to know more about your views. So if I've understood the question, tell me if I'm right, Ed. Uh, Ed wanted to know which of the in the discussion on uh, God's attributes what would be changed or where would be the personalist view depart from say some classical view about the God's attributes say impassibility or thank you very much by the way I, I just have to say you have been amazing this whole conference um, you you deserve a Nobel Prize for your versatility your kindness and um, agility, intellectual skill. Um, yes, so I sought to address this earlier, but I will say two other things. Um, one is that I think personalism would enhance our concern with the ethical significance of divine omniscience. As I mentioned in a conversation earlier, 
many people, especially in the United States, uh, are um, in earnest that they have been treated as invisible. Native Americans, Black Americans, Hispanic Americans, Mexican Americans um, have felt that their uh, lives are treated as marginalized, as insignificant. And the idea that there is a God who knows all things and values all people is something that goes completely up against that. It's kind of like, I'll switch from Christianity to Islam, but when you um, think about the advent of um, Islam in the Arabian Peninsula, actually the state of women um, was shifted and the state of actually tribal leaders was changed. That is, by, so according to sociologists of religion, if you believe in an omniscient God who will judge, you are no longer, and there's an afterlife, you are no longer under the sole authority of a tribal leader. Your tribal leader will have to stand before the judgment seat of God as well as you. So omniscience here and belief in an afterlife um, has had a notable effect. You can compare uh, the Babylonians and the Egyptians. Babylonians, no afterlife. Egyptians, afterlife. Egyptians tended to treat children with more dignity and worth than in Babylon. There's more infanticide there. So belief in omniscience and belief in um, a God of love and con compassion can have a, an impact there. The other thing, very, very quickly, um, John was mentioning um, being at Fordham. At Fordham, there's Brian Davies, a very eminent philosopher, uh, whom I is a friend and I admire him, but he's a classical philosopher, a Dominican, but he believes God is not a moral agent. And this is, uh, perhaps he's right, uh, but from the experience and the history of uh, Boston personalism, this would be the last possible resort. You can have a very high view of the not of the apophatic nature of God's true essence and so on. But one thing Martin Luther King Jr. is committed to is to believing in a compassionate, loving God who identifies with the weak and the vulnerable and who seeks their liberation. So a personalist approach is going to take individuals seriously, uh, just like other personalists like Ortega. But to go with Christian theists, you're going to take the individual, not just mass culture, individual is important, don't forget. Um, and um, you are going to believe that God is in the mix, whether on this planet, in this galaxy, and other galaxies. That it's, it's, it's motivated not by um, abstract and Selmian perfect being theology. It's sort of perfect being theology on the streets, protesting injustice. I'm talking to you two miles away from where George Floyd was killed last year. And um, this kind of theology is very much in my communities, communities of faith and philosophical communities. Let's try to come to in terms with injustice and what resources are there in philosophy and religion that can try to rectify the systemic racism that we've been suffering from. Thanks a lot. Yes. Uh, and are you satisfied with the answer? Do you want to follow up something or? Okay, silence, silencio ascenso. Okay, thanks a lot, Professor Charles. Also for the compliments, yeah, very welcome.